The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this uh, Nessie webinar about green solvents and their role in a more sustainable future. So uh, I am Felipe Fernandez. I'm a PhD student at the University of Warwick in the UK and also Director of Membership Activities of Nessie. And it's a great pleasure to have uh, you guys today in this uh, second webinar for this new series, series that we've been organizing. So uh, we are very happy to have today Anna Zanova from uh, the University of York and Lorenzo Herrera Davila from uh, Inchemia Green Chemicals. So I have to apologize that Lorenzo will be uh, probably joining us a bit late because unfortunately he had a problems with uh, small problems with his flights. Well, we all know this kind of things happening. Heck, I, this kind of things can happen. So Lorenzo will be probably able to join us in a bit. If not, you guys can uh, save your questions for him, and I'll be passing it to them, and he you'll be able to get in touch with you later. So. Uh, I would like to actually start by talking a bit about Nessie. Uh, I'm not sure if all of you who are attending today's webinar is actually uh, part of our uh, network already, but Nessie is a movement of scientists, it's, it's a global movement of scientists uh, and engineers that are connected to tackle um, uh, sustainability related challenges. So we have uh, different, of, different branches and we act in different ways to uh, inspire the new generation of uh, sustainability professionals. So we connect people, we build um, an international community of uh, scientists and engineers, and we also act locally by the uh, by supporting the creation of sustainable size groups. Uh, we also organize training events. Uh, they are uh, sometimes at conferences, like uh, we organized last year at ISGC. Uh, but also these kind of activities like this one uh, in terms of webinars uh, in a way that you're not only part of a community, but you're all also uh, benefiting from being a member of our uh, network. We build partnerships and also have a mentoring program in which you can get in touch with uh, experienced and senior members, uh, members of academia and industry that are actively making a difference in sustainability. So, uh, it's a great pleasure to be now introducing Anna. Uh, so the way that we'll be conducting this webinar is Anna will have some minutes to present a bit about herself and a bit about her research and her expertise. And hopefully we'll, be, we'll have uh, Lorenzo joining us in a second. And from there, you guys, we, we, we have some questions here that will lead the conversation. But uh, the main uh, actors here are actually you guys who are attending the webinar. So please uh, send send your questions along. Uh, that after the the presentation from uh, Anna, we'll be covering them uh, in, in in this main time. So now I'll be transferring uh, the power to Anna. So Anna, uh, you guys should be now able to see Anna's uh, screen. Okay, great. Let me just load up my presentation. There we go. Great. Thanks, Felipe, for that. And thank you for inviting me to uh, present on one of Nessie's webinars. As you know, I always love working with Nessie, and it's really great to have the opportunity to do so again. Uh, I was actually on Nessie's executive committee for uh, almost two years, I think. So that's how I know Nessie in the first place. And they're a really great group of people. So if anybody's listening who's considering uh, going out for Nessie's executive board, which the elections are coming up soon, I think, Felipe, in the summer. Uh, yes, uh, that's a very good uh, uh, point to advertise the elections. We are uh ha we have four new positions in the executive board as a director as a assistant for the the membership board uh finance director as well and director of sustainability science groups and the election the, the positions are open to the 6th of july so if you guys are interested you know getting part of uh, getting more actively part of nessie and make your difference and develop new skills you can uh send your applications 
by the 6th of uh, July. Yeah, so only a couple weeks left to submit those applications, but it's a great way to get experience with working with an international group of scientists. You meet a lot of cool people. Uh, you can get experience writing grants or doing executive management uh, type activities. So there's not a lot of organizations that will let early career scientists do that. So I'd really recommend it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about myself first, because like Felipe said, Lorenzo has not joined us yet. Uh, his flight was delayed, so I'm just going to extend my presentation a little bit and then open it up for questions. And I do encourage you to write down any questions you have. You know, it doesn't have to be about solvents. I'm happy to talk about where to get a green chemistry PhD, uh, other aspects of green chemistry, more about York or the UK where I'm currently living, or the US where I grew up. So really ask me anything within reason. Uh, so a little bit about York first. This is not New York, this is actually Old York, which is the namesake of New York, and a lot of people outside of England haven't heard of it, so I'll give you a couple of points of reference. First there's London, which is down in the south of England, and that's where most people fly into. Another big name city in the UK is Edinburgh, which is up north in Scotland. And then finally, York is halfway in between, almost exactly. And it's a beautiful little medieval town. It's had Vikings living here at some point. It used to be a Roman city. So there's a lot of history and a lot of ruins here. Uh, and I would really recommend coming to visit if you're ever in the UK or nearby. But if you do decide to come visit, you should come in the summer when these photos were taken and not at any other time of year when you're more likely to get weather that looks like this or like this, or even in some years like this. So really recommend coming sometime between May and September if you want to get the good weather in York. The Green Chemistry Center is based at the University of York, and we're a really, really large lab. We're still technically just one lab. We're not our own department, but we do have about 60 researchers right now, and sometimes it's as many as 80 if we have a lot of visitors. So it gets a little bit busy, but luckily we have the entire top floor of this building to ourselves and the bottom floor is teaching labs. So we're basically segregated from the rest of the department, which is, you know, can be good and bad, but it's really nice to have these state of the art labs because the building was only built in 2014, so four years ago. And we also have an industrial engagement facility where we host events and invite companies to come and talk to us about their needs in chemistry and we frequently provide them with green chemistry solutions in partnerships or collaborations or just short-term projects so i think that's actually a really interesting part of doing a green chemistry phd at york is you get to be involved directly with industry and see what their concerns are and learn a lot that you might not learn at a purely academic department so that's a big strength of ours let's get to the topic of the webinar let's talk about solvents so first of all we need to define what exactly is a solvent so one of my british colleagues here always calls it the liquid bit which is fairly accurate it is is usually liquid, uh, not always at room temperature, but liquid when you're running a reaction in it. The solvent is responsible for bringing the reagents in contact with each other. So frequently you have reagents where they're both solid at the reaction temperature, and you might have difficulty getting them to react without something to facilitate that. So that's the main role of the solvent, is to dissolve both solid bits and bring them in contact with each other. Another critical role of solvents is heat transfer. So if you have an exothermic reaction, you actually risk having a runaway re reaction or overheating, breaking your vessel, et cetera, or in extreme cases, explosions or fires, if you don't transfer the heat away from the reaction in a timely manner. So that's what solvents do, is they take the heat away and they dissipate it. Or in some cases, if you have an endothermic reaction, your solvent actually transfers the heat from the hot plate to your reagents and helps them react. So either way, it facilitates the reaction happening quickly and safely. Uh, the last definition of a solvent, which I think bears thinking about, not many people think about this, but it's not involved in the reaction itself. It can help facilitate it, but it doesn't get incorporated into the final product, because if it does, then that's just a liquid reagent. So those are sort of the three things that define a solvent. And when you start to get into solvent science, there's more and more complicated bits that come up, but those are the three main ones. 
So I have some examples here of solvents that are some very common, some less common, but up and coming, especially in green chemistry. You've probably heard of acetone if you're a chemist. You've definitely heard of water, no matter who you are. And NMP is a uh, common example of a dipolar aprotic solvent, which is used for a lot of specific types of chemistry. Then we start to get into the more esoteric ones. So we have BMIM PF6, which is an example of an ionic liquid. And those are, well, they have liquid in the name, but the common definition of ionic liquid is that it's liquid at some point below 100 degrees Celsius. So you may have to heat it up to access the liquid part of the name. Then we have debutectic solvents. The canonical example is choline chloride and urea. And these are actually two solid components and you mix them together and stir them without adding any heat and they immediately form a liquid and they stay liquid. So those are really interesting. They're uh, usually a bit greener than ionic liquids. And then finally, carbon dioxide is one of my personal favorite solvents. And you're probably used to thinking of CO2 as a gas. But if you pressurize it and keep it at the correct temperature, you can actually get CO2 to act as a supercritical fluid, which means that it acts as a solvent. But if you vary the pressure or the temperature, it has different solvent properties. And that's very easy to tweak. So it's becoming more and more common to use CO2 go to in decaffeinating tea or coffee, where we used to use dichloromethane, which is a really nasty solvent that you don't want to be, uh, you don't want any of that left in your coffee afterwards, uh, or ethyl acetate, which is natural, but still not as easy to use. But carbon dioxide, when you decaffeinate tea or coffee, you uh, pressurize the CO2 in with the tea and then move the CO2 CO2 to a different tank immediately afterwards, and it takes the caffeine with it, leaves all the flavor bits behind, and then you can just release the pressure and the CO2 turns into a gas and all of it is gone. So you have completely untainted food products. So I think that's really cool, but I'm happy to talk more about that later. So if solvents are so great and we have so many of them, why do we need more options? Why do we need green solvents? Well, a lot of the solvents that you just saw actually have a, lo a lot of hazards associated with them. So the diamond shapes that you see here are GHS symbols, and that stands for Globally Harmonized System for Classifying Hazards. So uh, let's see if I can use the mouse here. No, it doesn't look like you can actually see my mouse. Um, actually, but actually it's, we, we can see it. Oh, you can see it. Okay, it's just not showing on my tiny screen. So this toxic skull is very obvious, classic symbol for you will die if you come in contact with this fairly quickly. Uh, this one is a little lesser known, but it's equally important. It's chronic toxicity. So in some cases you will die slowly if you keep coming in contact with this, but in other cases, uh, you can have reprotoxicity, which means your children will have problems, mutagenicity, which means it affects your DNA, or carcinogen, carcinogenicity, which means that you may get cancer if you come in contact with this chemical or this solvent. So none of those are great, especially because most of the time the effects are not immediately obvious, so you don't know to stop touching that thing. So that's actually a really scary one, more so than the skull and crossbones, I think. Uh, aquatic toxicity is very obvious. When you put this chemical into the water, things die. So we have here a dead tree and a dead fish to, um, to show that. We have oxidizing solvents, which are nasty and accelerate fires. We have the flammable ones, which are very easy to light on fire and dangerous because of that. And then we have the little little exclamation point. And that one we're not so worried about in green chemistry. It usually means things like it's an irritant or it's a sensitizer. Uh, you probably just shouldn't touch it that much, but it's not going to kill you and it's not going to kill anything else. So that one, it's sort of okay. So in Europe and increasingly around the world, we have chemical legislation that is starting to affect the solvents that we are allowed to use. So REACH is the European chemical legislation, and it's quite thorough. It's just come into full effect this year and is really pushing industry to adopt safer chemistry and safer solvents. All of the molecules shown here are solvents that are basically coming under regulatory fire with REACH. Some of them have been restricted. Others are on the 
SVHC list, the substances of very high concern, which means that their use is going to be restricted soon. And if you want to keep using them, you're going to have to pay a heavy fine and also fill out paperwork justifying why exactly you need to use them. So all of this can be difficult to deal with, but it does present an opportunity for greener solvents to come in and take the place of these hazardous ones. For example, one of the classes of solvents that is currently in trouble with REACH is the dipolar aprotix. And these are solvents that are shown here, such as DCM, NMP, DMF, and their hazard symbols are shown as well. So you can see a lot of them have chronic toxicity issues like reprotoxicity, mutagenicity, and DMF in particular is also flammable on top of that. So DCM and NMP are currently restricted under REACH and industry is very rapidly moving to alternative solvents for those. Uh, and DMF is on the SVHC list, so it will soon be restricted. But there's not actually a lot of safer options for dipolar aprotix because it turns out that the things that make them functional, their halogen groups or their nitrogen groups or their sulfur groups are also the things that tend to make them toxic. So it's very hard to find a substitute that has the same solvent properties, but doesn't have the toxicity. And that's one of the challenges that we work on at York. So if you'll pardon my extremely obvious pun, what is the solvent solution for this problem of hazardous solvents? The answer is green solvents, but a lot of people toss around that word green and they use it to mean different things, uh, starting from the color green and going all the way to extremely deep environmental philosophical things. So let's talk about what we mean when we say green solvents. At York, we usually say that green solvents are safe for humans and for the environment. So we can't have any of the nasty hazard symbols, no acute toxicity, no, no flammability, no environmental toxicity, no chronic toxicity, and they cannot be oxidizers because those are dangerous to work with. So they also have to be bio-derived, uh, and this is something that people will quibble over. Some people say that as long as a solvent is safe, it can still be petro-derived and be green. But at York, we're fully supporting the transition to a bio-based economy, and we think as long as a solvent is derived from petroleum, it's not going to be sustainable in the long term. So bio-derived is definitely one of our must-haves. And finally, and this is the most interesting one, it has to meet industrial needs. And that's not something that has historically been included in the definition of sustainability or greenness. But if it doesn't meet industrial needs, even if you've got the best solvent ever that's safe for humans, safe for the environment, it's bio-derived, if it doesn't meet the functionality that the company is looking for, then nobody is going to use it. And your green solvent is useless if it's just sitting on a shelf. Nobody's going to buy it. Nobody's going to make it. So that's actually included in our definition of a green solvent. It has to be functional and it has to meet the needs that the company is looking for. So how do we actually go about discovering green solvents? We use a combination of methods that range from computational all the way to deep lab experimental testing. We start with things like HSPIP, which is a modeling software that predicts what sort of solubility behavior a chemical will have just based on its structure. So you can punch in the chemical structure and it'll spit out a region of Hansen's space, as we say, that the solvent is going to be in. So it lets you know, will it behave like NMP? Is it going to be more like acetone or water, perhaps? And uh, the predictions are fairly accurate, so it's a good starting point. We also use Argus Lab, which is a free piece of software that lets you do 3D geometry modeling and optimization. And it's free, which is the big selling point, or I guess not selling point. Uh, but it lets you do some very uh, preliminary geometry modeling to see what your solvent candidate is going to look like in three-dimensional space. And then finally, Cosmotherm, which is most definitely not free, but it's sort of the Mercedes of solvent modeling and molecule modeling. And it uses a combination of quantum mechanics and thermodynamic theory to, um, to model in great detail where your electrons are going to be distributed and how your solvent is going to interact with other molecules. So that's very useful but time consuming. In the lab side of things, we have CAT parameters, which are very similar to Hansen parameters. You can uh, figure out three parameters that define how your solvent is going to behave. But these ones, you actually use a probe dye molecule and you throw it in there and see where your wavelength of maximum absorbance is. 
So that one um, gives you a similar result to Hansen, but it's more empirically derived. Uh, we look at physical measurements. Obviously, melting point and boiling point are very, very important for solvents, but other things such as viscosity and density are also good to know. And finally, we do reaction and application testing. So we actually synthesize our solvent candidate and then test it in various applications, see if it's functional for the thing that we're trying to use it for. And one, ex one example of a successful test that we've done is this molecule that we call Sirene. And it's actually currently being scaled up by Circa, which is a company based out of Australia. And we found that Sirene is a green solvent. It's bio-based, it's biodegradable, it's got no toxicity uh, that we've discovered yet, and it's already registered under REACH. So we've done a good bit of toxicity testing for it. We found that Sirene actually outperforms one of the conventional solvents for graphene dispersion. So it's a very specific application, but it's a high value application. Graphene is a hot topic right now for electronics and fundamental research in advanced materials. And you can see the pictures here show the difference between trying to make graphene in NMP, which ends up sort of light gray, a very dilute solution of graphene, and trying to make it in sirene, where you get a pitch black, highly concentrated solution of graphene, where the flakes are actually bigger and more defect free than the ones made in NMP. So this is a case where the unique properties of sirene as a bio-based solvent, which are its viscosity and density are quite a bit higher than NMP, those properties are actually behaving really well in this application and adding value for industry. So this is our big success story, our flagship application of Sirene, where we found that we can sell it on the basis of it being better. It's a better solvent. It's not just a greener solvent. And that's always what we strive for when we can get it. So that was my fairly short presentation. I think Lorenzo is still not with us, right, Felipe? So we can open it up for questions at this point. Yes, uh, unfortunately, yeah, Lorenzo is not around uh, uh, because of uh, yeah the, the the delay of the flight, which is which is a shame. But yeah, yeah thank you very much, Anna, for uh, sharing with us uh, your presentation and your knowledge about uh, green solvents. And what we can do now is uh, start with the questions. So I have a couple of questions to kick off the discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, but the attendees are, of course, very welcome to contribute with your own questions. So whilst we are discussing the first couple of questions, um, we can, uh, you guys can just uh, put your questions in the webinar uh, platform and I'll keep an eye on them and then I'll redirect them to uh, Anna. So uh, I think to begin with Anna, um, something that you've discussed was I'm a chemist, right? And I think it all sorts of applications and, and needs for um, solvents are, at least in my head, always related with chemistry. But we know that uh, other areas of, uh, of uh, STEM or development or technology also explore quite heavily the use of solvents. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do you see this, the concept of green solvents and the utilization implementation being translated to other areas, let's say to uh, life sciences, to uh, physics, engineering. Is it something you see uh, being more and more incorporated or is it that's still something difficult to be adopted by other areas rather than, than chemistry? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think that in some cases, the problem has already been solved. So if you look at biology or biochemistry, a lot of the time the solvent is actually water and that's basically as green as you can get. So in that case, people aren't really looking for green solvents because they don't have any toxicity or hazard issues. The only issue with water is that it's high boiling so it can be difficult to remove. But if you're using something where you don't need to remove it afterwards, then that's fine. But I think in the case of engineering, it's definitely an issue. You have solvents that are used for cleaning parts in industry. So for example, if you're machining parts for automotives, you have a lot of grease and lubricant that stays on your parts once you're done machining them, and then you need to clean that off. And actually one of the most popular solvents to do that is NMP, which as we've just seen is highly hazardous and has just been restricted under reach. 
So in that case, we are actually looking for greener solvents for engineering applications. And uh, I don't know about physics. I've never worked in a physics lab, so I don't know. I, certainly theoretical physics wouldn't need green solvents, but applied yes. physics, <laughs> I imagine they would. Uh -huh. Yeah, I imagine like uh, the use of solvents to uh, disperse. I think actually a usual one example that can be somehow translating to physics, the dispersion of uh, particles. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. If you're looking at advanced materials as applied yes. physics, then yeah, absolutely. Graphene dispersion is critical to graphene mm -hmm. research. So if you have other applications like that, uh, if you're looking at polymer physics, solvents are deeply involved in polymer processing and polymer polymerization. Uh, so they would certainly be applicable there. And I think there's probably, probably anywhere that solvents are used with the exception of uh, biological and biochemical reactions where you're sticking with water. Anywhere else, I think green solvents could be applied. Brilliant. And I, my next question uh, is somehow related to this uh, application of the green solvents. So you've just uh, mentioned that uh, the sirene has been developed as a great uh, alternative because it not, not only um, uh, it's not only greener, but actually better solvent, but you also mentioned that it's quite a specific application. So is it something in terms of um, the application of green solvents? Do you see them being more export for, as I said, like specific and niche applications? Or do you reckon that in the future, both chemicals will be replaced by green, greener solvents? Yeah, that's a good question. The example I shared was very niche for sure, because it was the best example we have of a case where sirene is adding value outside of being green. And that depends very much on the green solvent that you're studying. There are some of them where you can make the case for value add because you no longer have to give your workers protective equipment, for example. If you're switching from acetone to something non-flammable, then probably your insurance is going to go down and you're going to save a lot of money that way. So there are incentives for adoption on a large scale. If Even if you have to make a change or two in your process, you might still end up saving money because of the safety proposition that we have with green solvents. So that's so that's the case for bulk adoption. The case against bulk adoption is that a lot of the times industry and especially large scale heavy industry is very resistant to change. They have supply chains that are already in place. They have partnerships with suppliers that they're not willing to break because they've been with that supplier for years and there's a lot of trust there. Um, there are cases where, for example, Sirene, it's a great solvent, it has a lot of applications, it's been tested and proven in many applications, but there's still only one company manufacturing it. And there are some large companies that will not touch Sirene because there's only one supplier and they have a policy where they cannot buy a chemical if there's only a single supplier. So it's barriers like that that we face in getting green solvents adopted on a large scale. But I think, I think the future is green. I think we are going to move towards more and more adoption of green solvents. And a lot of that is legislation driven. So we've seen uh, within the last two months in the EU, REACH has come into full effect. The deadline was, I think, May of 2018. So it just came in, into full effect. And NMP was also just restricted. It just moved from the SBHC list to the restricted list within the last few weeks. And we've already seen a barrage of questions from companies who are approaching us and asking, how can I transition away from NMP? What do you have for me? So even in cases where it's not a niche application, you know, there's cases uh, like graffiti cleaning is something that we're looking at, polymer dissolution, large scale applications where the specific properties of the solvent are not that important as long as it meets the basic need. Those applications we're seeing increased uptake of green chemistry and of green solvents. So I'm optimistic in short, um, but you know, it's a, it's a slow process. Petroleum has many, many years of experience on us and it's kind of hard to overcome that, especially when the costs of petro-based chemicals are so low, especially where they're subsidized by the government. So <laughs> there, there are barriers to be overcome, but I think we can do it. Brilliant. Oh, thanks. Thanks for your your uh, insights. 
Uh, I do have a question about regulations, but first let's jump to a question from our audience. Uh, so we, we have a, a Maria Alexandra uh, interaction with us. So she's saying, hello, uh, really interesting topic. However, I'd like to know if someone, some of the properties of the green source are not totally known and how would be the best way to certify something as safe? And of course, talking about solvents that might be useful in example like uh, cosmetics and food industry and of course uh, afterwards in terms of upscale uh, upscale the lab uh, methods for to industry applications and yeah that's that's uh, the question yeah there's a lot of a lot to cover there so um let me start with properties and I think uh, as, as a green solvent comes onto the market, more and more of its properties become known because more and more research is done around it. So my, my PhD project is in applications of styrene. So I'm gonna continue to use that as an example because it's what I know best. It's not the only green solvent out there. There's plenty of others, but it's what I know. So I'm gonna continue to talk about it. Uh, so styrene actually just came out as a green solvent, the first paper was published in 2014, so only four years ago. And because it had such promise, and because there was a company that was willing to scale it up and make its production, uh, make it more available through large scale production, there was immediate uptake and excitement in the ac academic community. So we have papers being published from various labs uh, talking about sirens application in Suzuki Miura cross coupling, its application in Sonogashira coupling, its application in synthesis of metal organic frameworks. Uh, we recently published a paper here at York talking about derivatizing sirene and creating a whole new class of solvents that are based on sirene but are a little bit more stable to acids and bases. And every one of those papers introduced a new consideration for its use as a solvent. So we now know aside from the basic properties of melting and boiling, density and viscosity, we now know a lot more about how stable is it to the bases that are necessary for certain reactions, how stable is it to acids, uh, how easily does it separate from certain other solvents that people are interested in using, and every new publication brings new data with it. So it's actually, if you can get people excited about it, it's actually a fairly quick process to gather more and more data about sirene. Uh, and the project that I'm working on right now, we're gonna be start looking at electrochemical properties. So we're gonna look at the dielectric permittivity of styrene, which is not yet known and is a more of an obscure property. So we're only four years down the line, we're already looking at the weird properties that not many people are interested in because we've had companies approach us wanting to do projects about them. So I think uh, that's sort of the process for how we learn more about new green solvents is we keep doing research and different labs keep doing research and different companies keep doing research and we quickly learn a lot about it. So I think that's the great thing about working in green solvents is you, you get to see your field sort of expand very rapidly if you've got a solvent that people get excited about. Um, sorry, Felipe, what were some of the other questions? Oh, yes, sure. <laughs> so I think the second part of the question was about uh, how to make sure that these uh, new solvents are uh, safe how's the best way to certify they're safe and mm -hmm. e even like in terms of legislation because as i said there are new products in the market how can you uh, make sure that they meet the current legislation you know it's yeah. sort of like a gray gray zone so if you can yeah. uh, just explain a bit to us yeah. how, how 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 it's uh, made yeah so this is actually a question that's going to depend on which market you're looking at because REACH is a very wide reaching and broad chemical legislation, and it has a lot of strict requirements for what a chemical has to pass before it can be registered under REACH. So the first level of REACH registration is Annex 7, and you can look this up, it's available online, the legislation, it is very long, I will warn you. Uh, but Annex 7 says that you have to do a certain number of Tests, tests, you have to do basic mutagenicity tests, you have to do a certain number of basic toxicity tests. Uh, flammability is easy, so they include that. So they try to make the barrier as low as possible for people to do these studies, but there is certainly a cost associated with doing them. So for any company that wants to bring a new solvent onto the market in the EU or 
elsewhere and then eventually imported into the EU, they have to pass a certain set of restrictions for safety that depend on how much of that solvent they're bringing in. So Annex 7, the easiest way to register under REACH is only up to 10 tons per year can be brought into the EU or manufactured there. And then Annex 8, the next step is up to 100 tons and so on and so forth. So the reasoning is that the more it is because you have a lot of it, so it can go very horribly wrong. So if you're only bringing up to 10 tons, they figure, well, let's just do the basic testing and make it easy for people to enter the market. And then the bar gets higher from there. So in Cyrene's case, it's already undergone Annex 7 registration and is currently finishing up Annex 8 testing. So I actually think the EU process is really great for this. Uh, the US is lagging behind a lot in terms of what they consider safe and how strong their legislation is. But we're seeing a lot of US companies that are actually adopting REACH as their standard because they know that eventually they're going to want to go to the EU and they might as well prove that safety proactively from the beginning. So I hope that answers that question of how something is safe. I will also mention, since Lorenzo's not here to do it, that Inkemia has a great catalog of green solvents. And what they've done is actually compile a list of not only solvent properties, but also safety and green properties that you can look at online. So if you go to Inkemia's website and look up their green solvent catalog, it's a great way to find solvents that are already proven to be safe or green in some way. Uh, yes, uh, uh, hopefully uh, Lorenzo will be joining us soon. So he just said that finally he <laughs> arrived at his destination. So oh, nice. he might be joining us in, in a sec to give another perspective of green solvents from a company that is actually now commercializing and developing green solvents and meeting you know, the needs. And it's very interesting because it aligns with uh, one of the topics you said that is, you know, these um, one of the three pillars of developing a new green solvent is actually that it, it should meet uh, industrial needs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, hopefully Lorenzo will be with us in a sec to bring a different different perspective. Um, in terms of questions from the audience, we have another one from uh, Dira uh, from uh, India. And he's uh, actually the question is about uh, opportunities for uh, internships at the Green Chemistry Center in York. I think this is a bit like we we, we have some other questions related to the the, the, the green solvents area, but mm -hmm. I, I assume that you and I, you can uh, give us a link in which people can can find more information about opportunities there later, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I would say just just Google GCCE York and it'll come up. I'm not actually sure what the website is myself. <laughs> um, I think it's york.ic.uk slash something but anyway just just google gcce york and it'll come up and we actually have um we're pretty well connected on the web presence side so there's a list of projects that are open for phd students and i think master's students as well uh, and i think visiting students are usually done more on a case-by-case -case basis but you can look up who the supervisors are that you would like to work with and maybe just shoot them a quick email and see if they reply. Brilliant. Well, thanks, thanks, Anna. Mm -hmm. um, now, coming back to the, the, the green solar side, uh, but still talking about the, the, these pillars uh, of uh, selecting a green solar. So you said that an ideal green solar would be safe both for humans and for environment. It's widely derived and also meets uh, the needs of industry. Uh, but when it comes uh, down to deciding about the application of something that not necessarily uh, meet all these requirements, uh, what kind of uh, methodologies do you have in place to make sure you are exploring the best candidate? Because I assume that you you have you can have like a pool of different candidates and have mm -hmm. to scope uh, to one. Do you use any sort of a, a multiple criteria decision analysis, statistical analysis? Basically, if you can. Uh, show go through the process of you know making sure that you have the best solvent uh, for that yeah solution. yeah and that's a good question because frequently there are um no no solvents that meet every single tiny criteria that a company asks for but we usually go back to the company and say look this is you've given us a list of 30 criteria so you're asking that our solvent needs to be exactly the same as your current solvent and that's just not possible 
So let's work together and figure out which ones are the most important ones and maybe create a ranking of criteria. So we usually generate a list of things that are crucial and things that are less important but nice to have. And then we work from there. So an example here is the uh, sirene for graphene dispersion project. We started with the full solvent database, which is in the Hansen solubility software that we used. And that's over 10,000 solvent candidates. So obviously this is you know, larger than any commercial database. They're not all gonna be commercially available immediately. But when we're working with a company where that's not really the most important thing, we do start with a full database and work from there. Uh, so in this case, we applied polarity criteria first, which narrowed it down to about 4,000 solvents, because that was the most important thing in dispersing graphene was the polarity of the solvent. And then we looked at surface tension and viscosity, which narrowed it down to about 22 solvents in total. And then because we were looking for a green solvent, we also checked for bio-based solvents. We checked how toxic they were. And then we checked if they were persistent or bioaccumulative or toxic, which is what PBT stands for. And we ended up with only three bio-based solvent candidates in the end of this. So we started with 10,000. And by going through one, two, three, four, five steps, we narrowed it down to three. So you don't always need to use principal component analysis or any of the other complicated decision-making processes that you could use. Uh, they come in handy sometimes, but in cases like this, you end up with three solvents at the end that meet all of the important criteria, and it's very easy to just go into the lab and test those three. So I hope that answers the question. That's generally how we go about it, but I know there are other green solvent labs that like to use PCA or other, I guess, more mathematically based methods for choosing solvents. No, brilliant. Yeah, it definitely uh, demonstrates it actually it's uh, the sort of the, the, the nature of how you approach the, the particular properties, it will narrow down the scope by itself, right? You, you end up having quite few uh, solvents that will meet the criteria. And from there, you, 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 can, you can choose what kind of approach you want, which is very interesting to understand how from a research perspective and also industrially uh, perspective, how, how you can select the best candidate. Yeah, yeah, it's not, yeah. It's, not always, it's not always as complicated as it sounds. You know, mm. we make these really nice graphics, but in actuality, what you have is a spreadsheet and you just gradually <laughs> narrow down depending on the column of the spreadsheet that you're looking at. So it doesn't have to be that complicated. Yeah, hopefully uh, with uh, Lorenzo with us, he can he'll be able to show the catalog that Inkemia has, mm -hmm. uh, which is, is something very similar. You can uh, put the parameters you want let's say in terms of the polarity, the boiling point, uh, the viscosity, I uh, think so. And from uh, saying the sort of the desired uh, criteria, the, the, this catalog will give you uh, some candidates. So I think it's it's very, very similar to this scope, the, the approach that you've been exploring in New York, which is very interesting. Yeah, yeah. if uh, you'd like, I can, I can try to pull it up now, or is there another question that has come up? Um, no, I, I have questions. <laughs> All right. I, I have uh, quite a few questions uh, prepared. Uh, actually, the the next one uh, links with the regulation uh, limitations that you've been mentioning pretty much all of the mm -hmm. answers. So I'm a bit more of, at some base in the UK. Uh, I'm a bit more familiar with the regulations here, but how does it compare with the regulations in terms of solvents uh, in the US, in, uh, in, in other uh, places of the country. Do you see like, a, uh, sorry, other places of the, the planet, uh, do you see some sort of a trend in terms of uh, which sort of solvents are being regulated and how they're being regulated? And basically also how these regulations can actually help uh, promoting the development of new uh, green solvents? Yeah, so it's it's a good question. I don't know a lot about solvent regulations in the US, except insofar as the government is failing to regulate them. <laughs> so that sounds harsh, but it's definitely true because in the EU, we've seen how effective the REACH legislation has been in reducing deaths due to hazardous solvents and other hazardous chemicals. 
But in the US, even as recently as last year, there were still contractors and you know people doing paint stripping at home who were dying because the paint strippers that are being sold in the US are still based on DCM. And DCM is quite toxic and will kill you if you inhale too much of it. So cases like this really highlights the difference that government regulation can make because in the EU, nobody has died from that in many years ever since REACH was implemented. But in the US, you, until recently, well, this is, this is where regulation fails and where industry can step in. Very recently, I think a couple of weeks ago, uh, Lowe's announced that it was stepping away from DCM. It would no longer sell paint strippers that had DCM in them. And then a couple of weeks later, Home Depot followed suit. And so now the two biggest DIY retailers in the US are no longer selling DCM paint strippers, despite there being no regulation that would force them to do that. So in countries like the US, we're actually seeing proactive adoption of green chemistry practices by industry, in part because it's the right thing to do, but also because they actually see a value proposition in convincing their customer base that the company is a green one and they care about their customers' safety. So I think that's actually a really interesting case study where until as recently as a couple of years ago, these companies were saying, well, there's no reason for me to stop using methylene chloride paint strippers. They work well, customers want them, and I would just be losing out money by not selling them. But then this year, they suddenly turned around and said, well, actually, wait, and we don't want to continue killing our customers by selling these paint strippers, so we're just not going to do it. Um, so I guess to answer your question, that's a major difference between how green chemistry is being implemented in the EU, where there's heavy regulation, and versus the UK, or sorry, versus the US, where it's very lax regulation. And you still see green chemistry making progress in both cases, which I think is really interesting. Now oh, that's brilliant, brilliant comparison between the two scenarios, and it's really um, important to understand like what are the limitations and also the opportunities in supporting these regulations and, and help the decision makers to uh, see the importance of going forward with uh, the green solvents and, and greener materials in general. Uh, in the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned about different kind of um, classes of green solvents. And what caught my attention was uh, you mentioned about the CO2, uh, but you also mentioned uh, the ionic liquids. And I am familiar with a bit more of a biopolymers area. I, I have a very good knowledge in the uh, green solvent area. And I remember people discussing a lot about uh, ionic liquids, and they would, you know, be the perfect um, uh, candidates to replace solvents in general. But I see that, uh, at least recently, in participating conferences in the area, it seems there's a, some sort of a difficulty in, in adopting them. And even you mentioned uh, very briefly that they might not be that good. So can you maybe like briefly discuss the differences between the three different kinds of uh, green solvents, uh, the pros and cons of each one, uh, so we can have a better understanding of what kind of alternatives you would have uh, in mind to explore? Yeah, so to be clear, the solvents that I've shown here are not really meant to demonstrate categories of green solvents. They're just sort of the first several solvents that came to mind when I was thinking about what a solvent is. So it's not, it's not a conclusive listing of types of green solvents, um, but certainly ionic liquids have been touted in the past as green solvents and deep eutectics are in that area as well and carbon dioxide is actually one of the solvents that we work with here at the green chemistry center so um, i can talk a little bit about those three things and how they differ ionic liquids they're really interesting because there's so many options so when you talk about for example dipolar aprotic solvents there are a handful of them, I think less than 10 that are commonly used in industry and in research alike. But when you talk about ionic liquids, you're actually talking about a vast library of thousands of different types of solvents, which are all variations on a theme. 
So in ionic liquids, you have generally a bulky cation and then uh, a bulky asymmetric cation usually, and then an anion that's a bit smaller and symmetrical. And the combination of those two actually makes a salt that melts at a very low temperature, so below 100 degrees, whereas most salts, you have to heat them up to 500, 600, 700 degrees to get them to melt, if you think about sodium chloride or something like that. So these strange ionized molecules that are bulky and asymmetrical actually uh, resist crystallization, which brings down the melting point a lot. And that's really interesting. There's been a lot of research in ionic liquids lately trying to push the boundaries of the shapes that you can make using them, the properties that those shapes can have. You can attach really, really long alkyl chains if you want, which will make it obviously interact better with fatty molecules, or you can shorten the alkyl chains, which is something that I worked on in my master's degree, uh, and you still end up with an ionic liquid either way. But the problem with ionic liquids is that they're frequently uh, hard to make. They're not being, most of them are not being commercialized at a large scale. So while theoretically they're really customizable in actuality you know you can't access that entire library at large scale so you don't have that option uh, they're also they frequently have toxicity issues which is not talked about that often and especially aquatic toxicity if you release these into the environment you're going to have quite a nasty spill on your hands and of course that's dependent on the specific ionic liquid that you're looking at but it's definitely worth considering uh, and then finally, they can be really expensive. So that's an important thing when you're talking about green solvents. In addition to being functional, they have to be cost effective or nobody can afford to adopt them and then you're out of luck. So ionic liquids, we don't really work with them much here at the Green Chemistry Center because uh, we think that other types of solvents are more practical choices when you're competing with a petrochemical industry. Uh, not to mention, it can be very hard to get ionic liquids from bio-based sources, so they're frequently part of the petrochemical industry. Deep eutectic solvents, on the other hand, are kind of similar to ionic liquids. They have a cation and an anion, and then they also have a second component, uh, or I guess a third component, depending on how you look at it. And when you mix those two things together, they turn into a liquid at room temperature. So you take choline chloride, you take urea, they're both solvents, and you mix them together and they melt right in front of your eyes which is a really cool effect. They're actually great for doing green chemistry demonstrations. Uh, and there is another lab, I think it was um, Andy Abbott who first pioneered these. So if you look up any of his papers, there's been a lot of different applications researched and other labs have started to pick them up. So they're a growing field in green solvents, um, but again, they're, uh, well, they're actually not that expensive, but they're a little bit more complicated than just a single solvent. So I think that, tends to scare industry away a little bit. And then finally, carbon dioxide as a green solvent. I've already talked about it a little bit, but you can do basically anything you want with carbon dioxide as a solvent. Once you pressurize it and turn it into a supercritical fluid, uh, you can, for example, some of the projects that we're working on involve uh, putting CO2 in with a bunch of biomass. So say you have some agricultural waste, some rice straw or something, you put the CO2 in with it and tune your pressure and your temperature to a specific point and you can take out just a specific fraction of that biomass. So you can take out just the wax or just the protein, solubilize a portion of it and then move the CO2 with that portion into a separate container and isolate it. And you still have the rest of your biomass sitting around waiting for, some, waiting for you to do something with it. So you can repeat the process and take out a different fraction and a different fraction, and you can end up with really high purity components of biomass just by using this one solvent. So that's really interesting, and that's the principle that's used to decaffeinate tea or coffee on an industrial scale. And obviously it's cheap, uh, sort of hazard-free aside from global warming, but if you recapture your CO2 rather than just releasing it, then you can just reuse it again. Um, and it's a really interesting example of what I would call an alternative solvent because it doesn't, you know, you can't grab a bottle of CO2 off your shelf and just dump it into your reaction flask, but it does hold a lot of promise for green applications. And then a lot of the solvents that we work with are what I would call traditional type solvents that happen to be green. So they are liquid at room temperature. You can just grab a bottle of them off your shelf. And a lot of people are sort of more comfortable with that because it's what they're familiar with. So I hope that answers your question. 
Absolutely. No, yeah, thanks for uh, giving this a very uh, interesting overview of all the different solvents, the different alternatives. Uh, so Lorenzo is, is actually connecting, but apparently he's having some uh, issues to uh, get access to the platform. Uh, yeah. So do you want to uh, have any sort of a final remarks uh, while he's trying to connect? Uh, and, and, and then yeah, you can I speak mean, and still have him. I've, uh, I've talked for a while, so I don't want to uh, <laughs> take up any more time. But if he's not able to commit and connect, then I'll just um, move back to my last slide here. Um, and I'll again encourage everybody who's listening to um, consider green chemistry as a career. If you're not in it already, uh, please reach out to me if you have questions about York or want to be connected with anyone here. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I've had a very good experience here, so I always try to promote it to everyone. And I've learned a lot about solvents. If you can believe it, I didn't know anything about solvents until two years ago when I started my PhD. And now I'm doing a webinar on them. So you too could be me if you go into green chemistry and do a PhD in it. Oh, sorry, I was just trying to get, see if we can still get uh, Lorenz on board. It seems like because of the time and he's still having some problems with the platform, uh, what we might do as a best alternative with uh, perhaps trying to record with him at some, uh, um, uh, so actually it seems, I'm just trying to understand if he's around. Um, yeah, well, I think yeah. most people are probably going to have to go, so maybe it's best to reschedule and have another Lorenzo webinar at a different mm -hmm. point. Yeah, no, it seems actually he's uh, he's around, so I think we'll be able to. Uh, yes, uh, there he is. Uh, so uh, yes, I could. Yeah, Lorenzo is around. Perfect. So <laughs> we might we we we'll be able to squeeze him in in, in a a couple of uh, I think to use this this last minutes to. Uh, bring a bit of uh, Inkemia's uh, perspective in, in green solvents. So Lorenzo, if uh, that's okay for you, I'll open uh, the mic to you and I'll make you uh, able to share with uh, your screen with us. So if you can get your screen ready, uh, I'll be sharing it with you if that's okay. I'll, uh, so we now should be able to listen to you. So welcome Lorenzo. Hello, good afternoon everybody. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Oh, great. Finally. <laughs> I'm really sorry about the, the, the horrendous delay of this. I mean, I have a, 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 probably the audience already know, I have a problem with a, with a flight. I was one hour, one hour late. Uh, but anyway, as, um, if I have the opportunity to, to uh, present for a few minutes, I will uh, give an overview of uh, what this uh, in Kimia's approach uh, on related to green solvents and particularly to the replacement of hazardous substances uh, in many different applications and product development. So if we start, uh, let's see. So it's just, uh, yeah, just yeah, uh, we, we now have you. Uh, so yeah. yes, now we see Lorenzo, perfect. So you can carry okay, on from great. that. Great, right. great. Okay. So, we start with the premise that um, all green chemistry dream is actually to uh, that every chemical in the economy is a con in no cause of causing no hazard for the environment. However, the real meaning of a, of a chemical in the economy is the function and it cost. So I'm pretty sure that all the audience, as all the colleagues and the research colleagues that they are listening to us uh, today, they have found in the day-to-day -day work different problems that involve the simultaneous uh, optimization of many different parameters in chemical systems of all kinds. Here we have an example of a, actually a problem that we have uh, solved related to the substitution of a suboptimal uh, solvent uh, that we had uh, some issues related to environmental health and safety and a very well-defined specification of how it had to perform. It's actually it's a cosmetic, it was a cosmetic formulation. Some of the functional specifications were related to, to the actual uh, functionality or how it needs to perform. Some other, as I already mentioned, they had to 
do with, uh, with uh, improvements on human health and, and, and physical hazard and environmental health plus regulation. So all of them need to be optimized for the product to perform equally as uh, it was doing with the suboptimal solvent, with the non-green solvent, as we were defined. So how, and actually how do we do that? And in chemia, uh, we take different ex uh, experimental and also uh, theoretical uh, models and approaches. And in this case, uh, what we took at the beginning, there were a number of solvents, there are 14 solvents, that they were carefully selected on, on criteria of maximum structural diversity and fitness to the, to the application. And, uh, and, and this, uh, really, what we uh, try to achieve is to use the minimum number of solvents to actually perform uh, the, the screen test and also to obtain uh, an optimum. The, the tests that they were carried out uh, had uh, mainly had to do with the stability. That was a critical part of, of in this type of formulation. So we uh, put, uh, let's say, all the candidate solvent we submitted for uh, freeze uh, thaw cycles and in order to uh, achieve the stability, to test them for stability as it was demanded by the specification. And what we wanted to, to get after the, the call uh, to for cycles is, is a transparent formulation. Uh, uh, let's say turbidity or crystallization in, in the final formulation were not acceptable. But this was not only enough. The customer was only demanding long-term stability uh, evaluation at high temperature. And after this test, we should not uh, have any hydrolysis, phase separation, or yellowing, as it was indicated in the in the specification. So after testing, the, after doing the initial test, we expanded to test to 47. And again, you will ask why. And the reason why is with the initial uh, preliminary solvent test, what we did is calculating the, the pro through, through our model, we estimated uh, the probability of uh, at least finding an optimum. But our model, what it says, is that going to uh, nearly 50 solvents when uh, the asymptote uh, reaches the maximum is where we will have the maximum probability of finding our optimum. So what we have here is mm, the ability of being able to determine the number of uh, with a high probability of, of success, the number of solvents that we need to be tested in the function of the uh, of, of a, a highly diverse selection of, of solvents. Also, in in this case, we test we ascertain that just using one parameter or just focusing on one physical uh, or physical chemical property, as it could be just solubility, looking at Hansen parameters. It, it wasn't uh, sufficient and it didn't, it could uh, lead to misleading results in this uh, complex system. We can see here, we have a target, the target suboptimal solvent with a set of uh, solubility parameters that uh, resemble some of the non-optimal, uh, both the non-optimal and the suboptimal solvents. So really just taking uh, solubility uh, parameters in this case, in this very complex system, uh, it will have been misleading. Uh, what we really achieve is the simultaneous optimization of the 10 of the 10 uh, parameters that they were prescribed in the in the specification. So in summary, taking uh, 47 solvents of our of our chemia uh, library, what we achieve is uh, getting to two two optimum for the, for the simultaneous optimization of 10 different, a very complex system, then different uh, parameters. So this example, what it shows is the, the, the important, the critical importance of chemical diversity and having uh, the right type of uh, compounds to uh, conduct this screening and this uh, optimization of, of, of green uh, candidates. And uh, an important aspect also is the um, trying when we build the libraries trying to uh, avoid the constraint between the environmental health and safety and the and the functional 
So chemical diversity is key. It's the key of resolution of complex uh, product development challenges. Why is this so important? Um, we have found over the, over the history of the company and where people come to us requesting for, for different uh, solutions to, to formulation challenge, that sometimes it's costly, well, most times it's really costly to introduce green chemicals at a later stage. But if this is done in early phases of R&D, uh, this is uh, in translating uh, effective uh, resolution of very complex problems. In this case, I mean, some example we have, some people have found bottlenecks and scaling up uh, the production of novel materials. And they were using DCM in the early stages, similar cases on different type of textile technologies with DMF and many others, you know, where they might use uh, 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 very uh, toxic solvents, some of them already mentioned by, by, by Anna earlier on, in agricultural products. So the conclusion for us is that uh, really what it drove us is to build our library over this 20 uh, year experience on the, on, the, uh, on the company. And in our library, we have more than 300 uh, solvents meeting the, the requirements given by DHS and the column model guideline for substitution. But ultimately our mission and particularly with our solvent catalog is uh, to let uh, and offer the R&D community this chemical diversity for them to, or for you effectively to, to test and, and try in different applications what uh, we have been able to, to succeed over, over the, the company, of, uh, over the history of the company. So ultimately you can uh, introduce this in your, in your, in your work and uh, being able to improve and optimize your, uh, your, your products and your processes. Um, this will be what is basically a, a summary of the way that we approach the solvent and replacement challenge. And just give just briefly uh, an overview of, of Inchemia. So already mentioned, we are a 20 year uh, history uh, company. We, we, have, uh, we are over 100. Uh, scientists working in 10 facilities, uh, mainly in Spain, but also we have facilities in, um, in, in Colombia, we have in, in Brazil, and, and here in Houston. Our focus, particularly with the development of chemical diversity, I mean, we, we have the capabilities of uh, creating chemistry from milligram to kilograms scale. Uh, we can see here uh, some of our members of, of, of our team and Dr. Uh, uh, Nati Bayarri with some of our small uh, reactors. We are a GMP, LMP accredited uh, facility. So we ensure maximum standard of, of quality, quality in product or materials and also like what is uh, discovery on, on a molecular, uh, molecular level, and elucidation. And we, we only don't uh, focus on solvents. I mean, we have a strong uh, drug discovery team that is here led by uh, Marta Pascual, and uh, that has led uh, this experience also access to different uh, plant pilot plant facilities and led into pro, uh, commercial production and, and eventually uh, into commercial distribution. That is uh, the activity that we mainly develop here in, uh, in Houston. Um, so, you know, just as, as a conclusion, uh, really what the, the in Kimia, what we offer is a, is a solvent, uh, is a search, uh, solvent search tool or ingredient, green ingredient search tool, which is um, a, a platform, a unique platform to solve very complex uh, challenges, formulation and, and various other different, uh, different areas of chemistry. And, and our catalog is there, available for, uh, for researchers to use and to support their uh, implementation or, or, or the replacement of hazardous substances in, in a wide array of products. Felipe, I'm not really sure if I have time to show um, people uh, a little bit the, the catalog. Uh, yes, if you, can, if you uh, can very quickly demonstrate the catalog. 
uh, I mean, yeah. uh, we, we're really, really thankful uh, for you to be presenting from the airport. Uh, this shows your, yes. your, <laughs> your, your commitment to uh, giving the message. And even after all this stress of all, all this long delay of your flights, being able to come here and discuss with us, uh, show, share with us a bit of your experience. Yeah. About so yeah, thank if, if you want to... Thank in, you for in, that. Yeah, you're welcome. If you want yeah. in five, ten minutes, in, in present five, quickly. Now. I'm picking up my suitcase now. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, yes. Uh, so no, joke, jokes aside. Uh, yeah, I will briefly show the audience uh, how the catalog works. Uh, as I said, our cat I'm just loading the, the link. I hope it works. Can you see it? Can you see something happening? Uh, no, it's too uh, on your. Oh, yeah, now, now, now we see it. Now we see it. Yeah. Ah, great. Very good. So what we have here as a is a it's a subset uh, hold on. It's a subset of uh, I'll get one second please. Maybe easier. Yeah. So go back. Sorry, go back one slide. Okay. Okay, here we go. So as, as I mentioned, what we have here is a subset of our, our, our green solvents chemical our library. We have made uh, available these two researchers for people to, to investigate, for people to use, to choose on function of their expertise. So what we have tried to achieve is um, uh, the maximum chemical diversity in terms of different chemical families, different type of, many different type of structures. And, and what all these products have in common, as already mentioned, is their high environmental health and safety profile that is being fixed uh, based on standards of the column model, of the GHS global harmonized system column model. So we have 100 products here, and what is distinctive from, from other, uh, other uh, catalogs that they may be available online is we offer a, a, a comprehensive selection of sustainability and, and physical properties and not only that we can filter the different products based on this sustainability and, and physical properties we will try to incorporate this here our methodology the way we develop our methodology based on on uh, multi-parameter optimization and this, you know, let's say, let's just put a very simple example. Let's assume that somebody is looking for at least a bio-based content in a product that is uh, miscible, uh, miscible in water. And, you know, they, they, they might be uh, initially looking you know, at a third time type of uh, or a range of... Uh, of, of solubility or looking at uh, as parameters, for instance. So, you know, uh, you know uh, maybe, maybe a medium, medium type. Uh, so a number of candidates come here. Obviously, the, this, what this intended is to help uh, the, the researcher in, in, in having candidates for the, uh, improving the, the, the research in terms of uh, Health and safety, particularly, but functionality. You know, that is what we try to do with these hundred products. You can input any variables you like here. Uh, obviously, it will be up to the researcher to uh, to look what might be interested or, or no, or what would like to try. And uh, we compile a wide range of uh, novel uh, novel products. Some some of them they may be interesting because of the, the soul, because of the end of life. Uh, for different type of, uh, of, of attributes. Uh, but again, ultimately what is uh, interesting in what we, the way that we have designed is try to achieve the maximum functionality for, for researchers to, to use. Um, and that will be briefly about, about, about the catalog. This is our team led by uh, Dr. Uh, Carlos Estevez in Barcelona, and then the team here in the, in the US with Professor Anastas uh, as chief uh, scientific 
by truck. And well, this is our contact. If you, if anybody or if you have any time for, for any question or, or if you know anybody want to follow up by email, I'm more happy to, more than happy to, to Thank you very much, uh, Lorenzo, for being able to conduct this uh, overview about leukemia and about uh, what you guys have been uh, developing in terms of uh, delivering new solvents to the market. And again, I'd like to thank you very much for being able, uh, uh, you know, apart from all the adversities, being around and uh, sharing with us uh, your, your knowledge on, on green chemicals. Uh, so I will just uh, change uh, to myself back. So I'm uh, my I'm the presenter again. So I'll just uh, let you guys. Uh, so I'm Anna and Lorenzo. I'll be now able to hear you all again. Uh, I'm like to thank you very much for being able to join us today and sharing with us with us your. Yeah, all your experience you have in developing green solvents, either in industry, in academia, be able to develop your, uh, devote a bit of your time to be here uh, for our members. Uh, if you guys want to get in touch with Anna and Lorenzo, please feel free to uh, drop an email to me, at membership at uh, sustainablescientist.org, and I'm very happy to uh, put you in contact with Lorenzo and uh, Anna. Uh, this webinar was recorded, so uh, you'll be able to hear and to watch it again later on. So the webinar will be included uh, at Nessie's uh, webpage, sorry, at our YouTube channel. Uh, and well, that's uh, everything. So Anna, thank you very much uh, for, for being with us today. Lorenzo, thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank, hey, you. thank you so much um, for having us. No, it was it was amazing. I mean, as I said, I, I'm 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 I have an experience in the material side, on, on the bio-based material side, not much with the green solvent. So it's been a great lecture for me, and I've learned a lot about green solvents. I hope our members uh, and and those who have joined us today or will be watching this webinar uh, later on can also learn uh, quite a few things about how to improve uh, the quality of their uh, methodologies of their systems by uh, adopting green solvents. And indeed, as uh, Anna extensively discussed, solvents are here to make a difference. They are a big part of a, a more sustainable future, not only in chemistry, but in different areas. And regulations in our side to uh, push for and create a driving force towards the adoption of uh, green solvents. So uh, again, thanks, guys. Attendees, there will be a survey that will be sent to you uh, very uh, soon, so you guys can have your voice heard and give us uh, ideas of what you want to hear for our next uh, webinars. Uh, that's all for today. So, in, in name of Nessie, I would like to thank you again for uh, spending this bit more than an hour with us uh, talking about sustainability and green solvents. And that's it for today. So, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Felipe. Thank you, Anna. Thanks, Lorenzo. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.